Hello, my name is Nudrum Key. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Whispers of the Old God expansion. Well, not as a whole. I might do like something like at the end where I talk about the whole thing. But for now, we're going to look at the initial, uh, I think it's like five cards? No, six cards that have been released as of Whispers of the Old God. Starting off, Validated Doomsayer. This is such a cool card. I'm glad they made it. Uh, for the sake of is it competitive, I'm going to like say no. But it's one of those cards that's like a big what if statement, right? Almost like Grim Patron was. It's like you look at Grim Patron and you're like, that doesn't seem that good, but what if it was really good? Right? And this is one of those cards that people are going to build decks around to an extent, which is always really fun. It is, uh, it's like epic, right? The purple one. It's like the 400 cost to craft, so it's kind of hard to get your hands on it, so sucks for me because I'm a free-to-play player. But regardless, I like the fact that it exists. Uh, you could try and get like a Frost Nova off, I guess, but a Freeze Mage wouldn't be the type of deck to run this thing, right? You need some kind of Freeze Mage that's minion-focused. Corrupted Healbot. Uh, this card reminds me of that 4-mana 3-5 in that I really like it. If you guys don't remember, there was, what was it? It was like Refreshment Vendor was its name. Uh, it was this 4-mana 3-5 acceptable stats, had like a cool effect to it. That's how I imagine Corrupted Healbot is. Everyone will look at this and be like, oh, that's kind of cool. That'll probably be useful in some way. And then when the card's released, nothing will happen. It's just kind of doesn't do enough like i've heard you can do like oh it's an alkanai combo or oh it doesn't matter if you're playing a late game control deck yeah but there's also much higher value cards than corrupted heal bots i mean it's five mana for one thing which means it's competing i guess it's not competing with sludge belch or anti heal bot or bomb blopper actually you know what uh the only thing it's really competing with is azure drake so i guess it's not that terrible of an idea for a control deck but it doesn't really have taunt or anything that uh, a control deck would want out of a card. It just has big stats, which value was good, but it's not enough value, I guess. Like if it was a 6-7, maybe even then, but I doubt it. So I don't think Corrupted Healbot will be doing very much. Now, Polluted Hoarder. Uh, this one I'm actually kind of sad about because Polluted Hoarder has the coolest art I've seen in a while. Like, zoom in to that art. I'm just going to zoom in on my screen. Of course, this is all just audio right now, but look at his teeth, how jagged they are. He has, like, the cute eyeballs that are, like, I don't know, <laughs> but, like, his skin's all gross and messy. It's such good art, uh, and I'm so sad because the card seems unplayable. <laughs> it's like... Spellbreaker was a 4-3 that was unplayable because its stats were just too weak. The 4-mana slot has always been very strong, and especially since we're gonna, probably going to see Yeti return, and Mage is going to be super op, op with Water Elemental. Um, I just don't see this card doing anything, you know? Like, I look at this card and I'm like, you're not going to do anything. Um, it's probably going to be better 4-drops. Even if there aren't necessarily better 4-drops, uh, you're probably not going to want this type of card for your card draw. You're probably going to still use um, things like Acolyte of Pain. Now to talk about all the exciting stuff, which is Twilight Elder, uh, Beckoner of Evil, and Cthune. Ooh. So Cthune is going to be one of four old gods, which are going to be like the legendaries of the set. And he seems really cool. Like I really like the design on this guy. Where do I start? Well, for starters, he has all the qualities of a really good high mana legendary. In my opinion, you have to do something the turn you play it. Uh, you have to compare well versus Ragnaros, right? Ragnaros is kind of the on the edge legendary, right? Every single deck could play Ragnaros, uh, and he would probably be viable. And that's like, I guess that shouldn't be the standard for all legendaries, obviously. I would love something like Harrison Jones. I love Gadgetan. I love Gazlo. But, like, if you want a really good, strong legendary, uh, that might enable some type of control deck, you want something that compares well versus Ragnaros. And I think Cthune does. Uh, because it gets so much value. It's like, 
even like let's say you just leave it as a six six right you play 10 mana six six and avenging wrath or whatever that like paladin card that deals six to all enemies is like that's already pretty good right like on its own it's not actually that bad a card but the fact that you can build it up to do insane value is what i think is really going to push this card over the edge uh, which it actually might need because considering i think the meta is going to be more aggressive in the future it wouldn't surprise me that 10 mana cards like this might end up just being unplayable I really like the idea of like the Beckoner of Evil and the Twilight Elder. Beckoner of Evil is really interesting in that the Beckoner of Evil gives you a 2-2, two, two, whereas the Twilight Elder gives you a 1-1. One, one. I think the idea is that 2-2 two, two is a much more competitive slot, right? Uh, two mana minions are generally going to be better, especially in standard mode. Three mana minions aren't going to be very good. You're going to have... um like, you're not gonna have stuff like Spider Dang. You're gonna have those two, like, three mana, uh, like, the Fiora Lightbane and Darkbane cards. Uh, so, but other than that, I don't think the three spot is going to be especially competitive. Probably gonna, like, see the return of things like Earthen Ring Farseer, right? So looking at Beckoner of Evil, it's, like, clearly much better than Twilight Elder. But that's almost to be expected in a weird way. And, I mean, it's it looks a lot better, right? But we have to keep in mind, this is basically going to be a 2-mana two 2-3 two, versus, like, aggro decks. Or even, like, a lot of mid-range decks where you just don't draw your C'Thun, right? Like, this... These cards are reliant. They do the dragon thing. Well, it's more of an evolution on the dragon mechanic, where in the dragon, you have to have a dragon in your hand to get the card extra value. In this case, uh, you have to have it in your deck, which is significantly easier to build around, right? Having a dragon in your hand is a lot harder and more random than having Cthune in your deck, I would say, or even in your hand, because keep in mind, Cthune can be wherever it is. So it'll be interesting to see how much, like, the fact that they, you get more early game options is kind of nice for these late game control decks, but I'm not sure how playable it'll be. I mean, uh, you do still have Knife Juggler, Flame Juggler, uh, you have Iron Beak Owl, like, there will still be good two drops. So it's just... Uh, but the whole point of playing Cthune is that you want the super value, right? I guess you can, like, leave it as a 6-6 six, six to dodge BGH. I don't know about Cthune's viability now that I look at it more and more, because I'm completely anticipating an aggro meta, and the fact that you have to put in these somewhat weaker cards to make Cthune work makes me, like, it makes me question the Cthune Thune pick style deck a lot more because it's very reliant on one card and that's that type of inconsistency can be really bad for a deck i guess you can go the elise star seeker route where you like play warrior but at least star it Cthune doesn't win you games like elise star seeker does so i don't know i don't know guys we'll have to like test it out ourselves i guess i would love to craft this card but there's probably going to be other legendaries i want to craft we'll see how it goes i guess Hi, my name is Nojum Key. Uh, so it's been a few days since I made the first half of this video, I guess, and more cards were released as I was planning to upload the video, so I figured I would just upload this with those videos. I am on Hearthpone, so this is going to be a little bit more sloppy in the editing, and I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, something very interesting. The first card pack you open from the expansion will give you Hathun, which was actually a big deal, so something that might not have been an issue for a lot of players um that people would think about i mean uh, you might if you're like a free to play player like me you might end up opening a lot of packs that would have cards like um the beckoner of evil and the other guy the three mana three four you might end up opening those guys in packs a lot because they're commons and rares and you just can't use them it's like almost like the murloc class right where well the murloc tribe of cards where yeah you have a, you opened a bunch of murlocs and packs but you don't have enough to make them viable i i was wondering if that would be a situation with the cthune set because the two cthune minions on their own are completely useless in most decks right so i'm very glad that they decided to just give you cthune straight up 
Uh, that's a very interesting choice. I wonder how they'll handle that. Um, yeah, so these are all the cards we talked about. You've already seen plenty of them without the silly hearth pwn thing they've stuck on the bottom. Stand against the darkness, five mana, some summon five, one, one silver hand recruits, right? It, at first glance, this is like, oh, it's super muster for battle. Well, muster for battle was kind of good. So this is just like a slower version of muster for battle, right? More value. And the idea behind that would obviously be, well, muster for battle was too good. So we had to tone it down a little bit and just increasing the mana cost and not necessarily increasing the straight value is kind of a big deal. A lot. Let's be straightforward, right? Stand against um, the darkness will never see play. Quartermaster is not going to exist in standard, and everyone is going to be looking towards standard, at least uh, as the game progresses. Maybe at the beginning you'll have a few naysayers be like, oh, wild's the best. Everyone play wild all day, every day. Uh, but the fact remains that the game's going to be balanced around standard, most likely. It's just easier to deal with, uh, to avoid power creep and such, if you're not having to look at every single card you've ever made, such a gigantic card pool is very difficult to balance properly, right? So getting rid of Must for Battle um, and replacing it with, well, functionally replacing it with this, it's not actually a straight replacement, but replacing this with Must for Battle is a big deal because everyone's going to be looking in standard mode and by removing must for a battle you remove a huge part of paladin's power there's two main problems with stand against the darkness that i think we need to talk about firstly must of her battle included a one four weapon which was very powerful right there's no denying that paladin having like a way to deal one damage was a huge point of pressure especially because of the shielded mini bot uh, must for battle combo, you played shield and minibot, oh, well, they'll play mech warper, that's fine, you'll just play must for battle and clear the mech warper, right? Three health and two health were very similar in the early turns of the game, which is a big problem. Well, not necessarily a problem, but it's a big plus if you are the class with that flexibility, and it's a big problem if you are playing against the class with the flexibility. So firstly, we don't have Light's Justice, but then here's the issue. You take a 3 mana card that gives you 3-3 three, three of stats, right? Now you have a 5 mana card that gives you 5-5 five, five worth of stats, and yes, it's more spread out, but it's like, a it's a better version of Dark Whispers, but it's still not good type of deal. Uh, even if this was some 6 one, one Silverhand recruits, at least that would be more value, because you have to keep in mind, the higher the mana cost is, the more value it needs to get. That's why some of these legendaries are so insane, right? That's why Dr. Boom was allowed to exist, because you look at it and you're like, oh, it's like 7 mana card, it should have 7, 8 worth of stats, right? But that's not true. That's just not. The more mana you pay for something, the more stats it should have, so... In theory, uh, one mana card should have one, two, and a bonus. Two mana should have two, three, and a bonus. But then around five mana, it should be like five, six, and two bonuses, right? Because you're paying a lot more mana, you should be getting a lot more value out of the card. Or at least, like, conditionally get, like, two bonuses, right? Because of that, Stand Against Darkness just seems super weak. I mean, Granted, we don't know the state of Paladin, right? Paladin might just be absolutely crap after the release of Standard, so maybe they will actually somehow need to make use of Stand Against Darkness, maybe with um, the 2-4, I think it's called Warhorse Trainer? I don't know. We'll have to see. Obviously, we'll have to see about all of these, won't we? Uh, but this card seems completely unplayable at the start. Hogger Doom of Elwyn. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. Once again, I'm, I've not played World of Warcraft, so uh, I'm gonna miss out on that sweet, sweet, like, free paladin hero replacement border thing. I don't care about it too much. Although I would, I should feel like I should go play WoW and get to level 20 now, but that's different news. I don't really care about the hero portraits right now. We care about the cards. And Hogger Doom of Elwyn, uh, is an interesting one. So, it's the 7 mana 6-6 six, six, whenever this minion takes damage, summon a 2-2 two, two, null with taunt. It's an evolution on the hogger aspect, right? Uh, is it even just like a corrupted version of hogger? I know they were trying to do like, oh, we destroyed the old cards, the power of the old gods have, old gods, old gods have infected the heal bot and the doomsayer and while the flavor was all very nice, is that just like the entire set 
I guess that kind of makes the shows like, if I see the art for this, oh, just kidding. Well, if you look at your own, the art for this, it has like a bunch of tentacles all over, just like in the background. It's really interesting. Hogger seems to have sprouted a few tentacles himself, or he's just putting on a cool wig. I mean, hey, you gotta fit in with the new kids, and sometimes it's just hard to stand out, you know? Or fit in. I don't know. The main problem with Hogger is that he is stupid hard to do, or to um get the value off of, right? At least with uh, Uncorrupted Hogger, you had a guaranteed 6-6 six, six of value for 6 mana. This card, even if you proc him once, like you kind of get value, but again, it's the problem that 7 mana doesn't necessarily need 8-8 eight, eight stats to be good. 7 mana needs to have like 10-10 ten, ten worth of stats to be good. Otherwise, it's just kind of a weak card. Not The thing is, like, I want to say this might be okay in something like Priest, right? That's like my instinct. But I just don't know. It is a 6-6, six, six, which means it dodges BGH. Uh, but it doesn't do anything on this turn it's played, it's 7 mana, and you're going to have a hard time getting value off of it. And by value, I mean a lot of value. Although, I I, I do vaguely remember Trogsworth the Earthenator, right? It was, I think, a 7 mana 6-6 six, six whenever your opponent cast a spell, like, give you a 3-5, right? That card actually turned out to be really powerful, because it reacted to what your opponent did. Uh, but it was kind of, it was kind of similar to this as well in that you needed, you needed something for this to work, right? If you just played it as a minion and your opponent already had board control, it wouldn't do shit. So definitely if you are head on board or if the board was just cleared by, I don't know, Frost Nova Doomsayer, this could be playable. You know, if we want to theorycraft a little bit, you could make like validated Doomsayer Freeze Mage. And put Hogger or Doom of Elwin in. That could be fun. Next up is the one I'm actually excited for. A giant sandworm 8 mana 8-8. Eight, eight. So baseline stats isn't amazing, but you know it's acceptable. It's definitely a gigantic fucking minion. I definitely wouldn't turn about on like an iron bark minion. Especially in arena, because this is keep it look at this. This is a purple gem, right? I think it's epic. I forget. It's like I think it's basic rare epic is the rarity value. So like the gems from the cards, like basic's the most common, rare is the blue one, which is the next most common, and then purple is the epics, obviously. Uh so giant sandworm, when if this minion kills another minion, it can attack again. This is a card that a lot of people kind of theory crafted on a hearthbone. If you look, there are like some card making prog thingies where it was like, okay. If this minion kills another minion, then it can attack again. That was actually a pretty common theme amongst like the hunter card, the hunter card theory crafters, and obviously it was beast, because it would synergize with Tundra Rhino, right? And the idea of Hunter having a really powerful removal was really appealing to a lot of people who play Hunter, because here's the thing about Rexar, right? Rexar likes going face. His hero power is designed to go face, and he has a lot of really good class cards for going face, such as, um, Quick Shot, uh, he has his Steady Shot, obviously, he has Kill Command, uh, he has Huffer. People don't want Huffer. It is always Huffer, but people don't want it to always be Huffer. People want it to be Misha sometimes, and sometimes you want Leok. And the fact is, right now, Hunter is super pigeonholed into that playstyle because they just don't have good cards in other places. They have Explorer's Hat now, which is kind of helping spawn a new archetype, but Hunter's Hat on its own isn't actually a good enough card because you lose so much tempo. Yeah, infinite value, great. You're also way too slow to do anything, and you can't abuse the Hunter's Hat, um... In the way you could abuse Dreadseed, like with Baron Geddon. Not Baron Geddon, shoot, Baron Rivendare. Uh, especially now you can't do it because Baron Rivendare is banned, it's in standard mode. Uh, we're talking about standard mode, of course. So, if you can't abuse the Hunter's Hat and Lock and Load just doesn't seem to be working out, uh, I, I'm, I don't know how Giant Sandworm is going to function. Cause ideally for this Giant Sandworm, you'd want it to have charge. But even if it didn't, right? You would just play your 8-8 minion, it would get Big Game Hunter, and then you make way for Rackmose and it's all hunky dory, right? Yeah, hmm. 
I, I want this to be good, right? Like, let's be clear here. I want Rexar that doesn't go face. But, like, without Finley Merkurkel, then, it's just, it doesn't look like it's going to be happening. And this isn't the card to change the class entirely. Although it is not, it's not a bad start. I mean, you know, having some really good high value minions can be a good start. Although I probably, I guess the thing to do would be to say, what other card would you compare this to, right? And, my immediate, my immediate response is Iron Bark Protector, and I would say Iron Bark Protector is a little bit better, but still not very good. So, you're not better than the bad card. You're going to have a problem. It's, it's just such a cool effect. Couldn't it be like two mana less? Heck, even one mana less. I'll take it. Just draw both and play Thoros and you get the ultimate combo. Boom. Done. Easy game. Easy life, right? Ah, just, I I don't like it, but I want to like it type of a deal. I feel bad, man. Man, Brexar better get some good fucking cards in this expansion, because, like, all of these cards seem super underpowered at this point. Like, yeah, there's none of these cards that I look at and I'm like, this is going to take over the game. At least with, like, the Grand Tournament, right? There was that, like, Aviana card that I was completely wrong about, but I was I looked at that card and I was like... This effect is going to take over Hearthstone and define the meta. We haven't gotten that yet, which I feel kind of sad about. Eater of Secrets. Hmm, I wonder what this is trying to counter, right? Um, so we, this is, okay, so four mana, two, four, battle cry, destroy all enemy secrets, gain plus one, plus one for each. I wonder how that works with Brand Bronze Beard. I assume you would just get the plus one, plus one, not double the buff. So this is, very, very clearly a secret paladin counter. <laughs> in the current meta, and I know this because I've gotten to rank 13, uh, this Hearthstone, which is this Hearthstone season, which is pretty high for me personally. Um, we are playing like 50% secret paladin and then like control warrior and freeze mage trying to deal with secret paladin, right? Like, if secret paladin is the deck that's defining the meta right now, which is both extremely cool to see. Uh, I love seeing a deck that's really strong because it means I can build my decks around to counter it. But also it's really annoying because if you want to have a fun deck and then you run into Secret Paladin four times in a row, you kind of get a little bit angry at the unfairness. So, so here's one card. You hold on to it. You don't play it until they've played that 6-6 six, six, and then you crush all of their dreams. And it's not even that bad against Freeze Mage either, is it? So it's kind of like a flexible tech card. Kazan Mystic wasn't good versus Secret Paladin and there's not really any other counters to Secrets yet. So introducing a proper counter to Secrets is really important. Especially when you consider that this card is good even if it just hits one secret. Like even if, even if it just hits a Freezing Trap, right? That's a huge swing. You might say, well, then it's just a 4-mana 3-5. That's not very good. You have to keep in mind, it removes the enemy secret, which is actually a huge deal. It's a huge loss in tempo, especially when you consider Mad Scientist is out. Actually, I shouldn't skim over that. Mad Scientist is going to be removed next season, right? So, well, not next season, next expansion. So, Mad Scientist made every single secret somewhat playable right even the shitty paladin ones like i saw people i was obviously in rank 20 back then but i saw plenty of people run mad scientist and secret paladin when it was first becoming a thing that's because mad scientist just made everything better like death two mana two two death rattle like summon a two one whenever your opponent attacks like that's that's great still that's pretty good value um it was just often very predictable uh, to play around the Paladin secrets that were just really weak, and obviously there were other cards you wanted to fit in, like Muster for Battle, Shield, and Minibot, Knife Juggler. So, the question, I guess, is, will Eater of Secrets see enough play that Secret Paladin can no longer be a deck? I kinda hope so, because we need something to shit on Secret Paladin, and it's not gonna be any of these cards, I can tell you that right now. I guess that's it for this video. As cards will be announced and released, I will continue to make reviews of them on the spot and will probably take a retrospective, uh, oh my god, retrospective. I'm using that word correctly, right? Retrospective? That's like to look at the past, I think. Hopefully I am. If not, uh, oops. If so, haha, get wrecked. I'm the nerd here. So, yeah, looking at all these cards. 
I have to say I'm so far underwhelmed by them all. I should actually keep in mind, and this is a fairly important point, we aren't having piloted Shredder. We're not having well, a lot of things. We're not having Sludge Belcher. We're not having the Spectral Spiders. Actually, thinking about it, the overall quality of the cards in the game are going to be a lot lower. So I should keep in mind, and this is mostly a reminder for me as I'm reviewing these cards, the requirement for a, gar a card to be in a constructed deck is going to be a lot lower, right? Because a lot of the power creep that has sort of gotten in on GVG and has gotten in on League of Explorers, that's probably going to go down a lot, right? Uh, GVG was a very weird expansion. It's when they started really committing to the randomness, the Hearthstone the ve developers. With GVG gone, the entire quality of the card pool has gone down somewhat significantly. It's actually crazy to think about. And Nax, of course. I, I do mean Nax and Grammys, of course. So maybe some of these cards that I've deemed unplayable might end up being playable. But I kind of doubt it. Like, Cthune right now is kind of the only card I would actually expect to see play. Eater of Secrets is conditional and everything else just doesn't seem good enough, in my opinion. It will see, you would have to build decks around them to make them really good. And we'll have to see what other cards are released in the expansion. So far, kind of underwhelming. Hoping Blizzard brings out some cool stuff for the Old Gods expansion. Because I am super excited to see new stuff added to the game overall. Thank you all for watching. My name is Dutch Key. I will see you guys in my next video. Goodbye.